So this, this month, we're talking about the road to the cross, at least the next few Sundays, because in terms of church history, right, this is Jesus' Jesus's last month on earth, right? Last month, um, at least in terms of right before the resurrection. So uh, the next few Sundays, we're going to be talking about the road to the cross, Jesus heading to the cross, um, Jesus' life and ministry today, and then next week, we'll do Palm Sunday, and then Friday, we'll do the cross um, for, for Good Friday, and then Sunday we'll talk about the resurrection. And so that's, that's the plan for April. Um, and so today, it's going to be a little different. A little different. Because instead of looking at just one passage of Scripture, we're going to look at the life of Mary of Bethany. She was one of Jesus' close friends, really close friends. Um, and there's a reason for that. And we're going to look at her life and the way she interacted with Jesus. And that will show us... Um, Kind of a picture of how Jesus changes lives. Because Jesus radically changed Mary of Bethany's life. But also different today is we're going to do it in a little bit of a different way. Instead of me just talking about what the Bible says, I'm going to do a first person message, which I think Christopher might have done these before. It's where I pretend to be one of the disciples today. And I'm going to talk about the stories of Mary of Bethany interacting with Jesus from the perspective of one of the disciples. So I'm going to pretend to be Andrew, and we're going to walk through the stories of Mary of Bethany and Jesus, right? So we're, we'll, uh, we'll begin. So hello, my name is Andrew. I am one of Jesus' disciples. Um, I have been with Jesus for like two and a half years, almost three years, walking with him, being, following after him, listening to everything he has to say. And I'm going to tell you the story of one of our friends, one of Jesus' closest friends, Mary of Bethany. We first met Mary of Bethany in a very strange and unique way. See, we were invited to a dinner party. And this dinner party was held by a very well-known, very high elite guy in the society, Simon the Pharisee. So Simon the Pharisee, he had all the power. He was pretty wealthy. We were excited. We got some good food. Some, you know, we're going to this nice dinner party. It's going to make Jesus look good. We're reaching high society, right? So here we go to this dinner party, and everything's all posh and nice, right? Everything's the good food, and we're just sitting there hanging out. And then in comes this woman, and she's crying and she's kind of uh, bawling over Jesus, right? And so when we talk about crying, it's not like, like little tears. We're talking, she's like weeping, like ugly crying. And she's just like weeping at Jesus' feet. Now, if you've never been to a, a Palestinian dinner party, what we do is instead of sitting in chairs like you all are, we're kind of laying down on like these little couches. And so Jesus was laying down on this couch, and she was standing at Jesus' feet just weeping, and we're all kind of awkward. We're, what do we do? <laughs> it's not every day you're at a dinner party and this random woman walks in and just starts like crying in front of the main dinner guest. And she was crying so much, she was like weeping on his feet and she started to wash his feet, which was a common practice in, the, in, in our day. We, we would wash each other's feet because the road was dirty and we were wearing sandals all the time. And so it was a common practice to be hospitable in that way. But she was weeping and she was using her tears to wash Jesus' feet. We were all kind of like, what do we do now? Like, do we just pretend like it's not happening? And then you look at Simon, and Simon is grossed out. Right? Like he is disgusted. And maybe there was even some murmurings. We heard some murmurings of, man, this woman, what is she doing here? And then Jesus turns to Simon, and he says, Simon, I have a story for you. Well, here comes one of Jesus' stories. The stories that always has like this hidden meeting. You know, he always said these <laughs> intricate stories. He said, Simon, there were two people. Both owed their masters money. One owed the master just a little bit. Other owed the master a whole bunch. Master forgave all the debts. Which do you think would love the master more? The one who owed just a little or the one who owed a, a whole lot? And Simon said, well, the one who owed a lot. And we're like, well, yeah, duh. That's the right answer. And Jesus then looks directly at the woman, but says to Simon, you know, you didn't wash my feet. You didn't give me a kiss of fellowship like we do, you know, like the kisses on the cheeks. You didn't welcome me into your home very, very lovingly. But this woman, she's been washing my feet with her tears. She's been kissing them. She's showing this great act of love and devotion. 
She has been forgiven much, so she loves much. And then he tells the woman that your sins are forgiven. And that's how we first met Mary of Bethany. What we didn't know about her then, but we found out later, was that the whole town, Simon included, knew who Mary Bethany was. She had a bad reputation. She was called the sinner. She was ashamed. She was rejected. She was unwanted. Nobody wanted her around. Nobody wanted her, them, her in their lives. They didn't want her in their social groups, right? She was the reject. But here she was, standing in front of Jesus, just weeping in shame and guilt and repentance, and Jesus loved her. When everybody else was just like, what is she doing here? So Jesus loved and accepted her in that moment. That was our first introduction to her. Well, we got to know them. We got to know the family. Mary, she had a sister named Martha and a brother named Lazarus. And one day we went over to their house for dinner, um, which was a huge deal, right, for Jesus to recognize their family and go over to their house for dinner, wanting to be with them. Huge deal. Well, we get to their house for dinner, and we're sitting there. Lazarus is there. Mary's sitting in, in the main room, listening to Jesus. And all of a sudden, we hear, like, noise from the kitchen. Well, oh, Martha's cooking the food. But then all of a sudden, we hear, like, like pots, like, banging and, like, things going off. And you hear, like, some mumbling, some... And we're like, what is going on? And Martha's getting a little upset. And also, Martha storms in. She's red-faced. And she's like, Jesus, why don't you tell Mary to stop just sitting there, get off her, her, lazy, her lazy bottom, and come into the kitchen and help me with the food? And again, you can kind of look at Mary. We looked at Mary, and we saw her just shame on her face. She turned with, red with embarrassment. She could tell she was ashamed. He could tell she felt guilty. And Jesus said, wait, wait, wait. Leave her alone. He said, Mary has chosen the better thing. She, he said, Martha, you have so, you're worried about so many things, and that's okay. But Jesus said, Mary has chosen the better thing. And he defended her. So that was our second time interacting with Mary of Bethany. And then we come to the third time. And the third time is pretty famous. You've probably heard of it already. But let me tell you the story again. Well, we were in, in uh, this area of Galilee. We got a message from Mary and Martha saying Lazarus was very sick. And then he was on the verge of dying. And they asked Jesus to come and heal him. And so we're like, okay, we got the message. We started packing up the, our clothes and our, our few supplies. And Jesus is like, no, 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 we'll wait. I'm like, okay, Jesus, I mean, you're the boss. We'll wait. So we waited a few days, and all of a sudden Jesus, a few days later, said, okay, we're going to go now. Lazarus is asleep. We're going to wake him up. We were kind of like, wait a minute. Jesus, if he's asleep, that means he's getting better, right? You sleep, you get better from your sickness. And he said, no, he's sleeping the sleep of death. We were surprised. Here was Jesus' friend Lazarus, and he was sick. Now he had died, and Jesus was just kind of hanging around, just waiting. Why didn't he go right away? Well, we decided to go. So he went, and we well, we're going to follow you. So we followed Jesus to right outside of Jerusalem in, in the town of Bethany. And as we entered into the town, we heard the, heard the news. Everyone was talking about the fact that Lazarus had died. As we approached the house, Martha came running out. She came running up to Jesus, just like Martha would, her personality would, came right up to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you would have been here, Lazarus would not have died. If you would have been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Why weren't you here? And Jesus said, hey, don't you know about the resurrection? Don't you know that people will rise again? And, 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 and Martha said, yeah, I know about the resurrection. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe on me, you will never see death. And Martha was a little confused, but she trusted Jesus. But then we were looking around, and we couldn't find Mary. Where's Mary at? Come to find out, Mary has stayed in the house. She just stayed in the house. She didn't want to come out and, and see Jesus. So Martha went back and got her sister, and as, as Mary was coming out to, to finally meet Jesus, you could see it on her face, the same look. The same look she had in the, with Simon, in the house, the same look she had after Martha, you know, chewed her out over sitting down and listening instead of helping her cook, look of shame. And she comes up to Jesus, and very different than Martha, Martha was more, you would have been here, Jesus, why weren't you here? Mary, in shame, said, Jesus, if you would have only been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And with Martha, 
we could hear Jesus. He gave her a big reply, right? He said, oh, don't you know about the resurrection? Don't you know that God's going to rise? He gave her answers because Martha was looking for answers. Mary wasn't really looking for answers. Mary was full of shame. We, can, we looked at Mary and we kind of saw that maybe she felt like it was her fault. Maybe she thought that, oh, if Jesus would have loved me more, maybe he would have came right away. Maybe if I was good enough or a better person, maybe Jesus would have responded right away and Lazarus wouldn't have died. So Jesus didn't give her answers. Instead, he just said, take me to his burial, to his grave. And so we started to walk, and something happened that I hadn't seen happen before. Jesus started to weep. Again, this isn't the few tears. This was ugly cry, like bawling and crying for Lazarus, for Martha, for Mary. And he was just weeping. And then the funny thing is, is we look back on the story, and you guys know the ending of the story. Jesus knew the ending of the story. Why was he crying? Why was he mourning over Lazarus, who he knew he was going to rise, raise from the dead? Well, if we think about it, we saw him crying, yes, for Lazarus, the fact that his friend had died, and that the world was such a place in that we have to face death. But he also was crying for Mary and Martha. He was crying that they had to experience the pain that Mary felt so ashamed and guilty and afraid to even come out and see Jesus. He was weeping over the fact that Mary still probably felt unwanted, unloved, rejected, full of shame. And then, as you know, the story goes, Jesus got to the grave and said, roll the stone away. They rolled it away. He called for Lazarus to get out of the tomb, and Lazarus just came walking out after being dead for four days. Everybody was so astounded. We all just stood there, like, looking at him, and Jesus was like, well, unwrap him. Right? He was still wrapped in his burial stuff, and we were all, like, frozen. And so we did. We unwrapped him, and Lazarus was okay. And everyone heard around the town that Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus. And then we come to the last, one of the last stories, at least before the cross, of Jesus with Mary of Bethany. And this is when Jesus went to Mary and Martha's and Lazarus' house. And we didn't know this at the time, but this was seven days, one week, before Jesus was going to die on the cross. One week. He had one week left on earth, and Jesus chose to spend most of that time with his friends in Bethany, going from there to Jerusalem every day for the next seven days. So he was there at the table with Lazarus, of course, who had been raised from the dead, and Martha, yeah, you kind of guessed it. She was in the kitchen cooking, right? She wasn't really angry this time. She was accepting the fact that this is what her gifts were, and she was doing them. And then Mary comes in. Mary is carrying a pound, which is a huge amount, of expensive perfume. And she looks way different than she looked that, that year or two years ago when she was in Simon's house. She didn't have shame on her face. She wasn't embarrassed. She wasn't weeping in guilt and repentance. She confidently walked up to Jesus and began to wash his feet with the expensive perfume. And just the look and change of what happened to Mary. When first she had nothing, she came to Jesus totally broken as a person, it's totally feeling the shame and the rejection and the fact that she wasn't wanted, that she was isolated, that she was pushed out. And then through the story, how Jesus defended her. There, he defended her against Martha. He loved her and wept for her at Lazarus' grave. And now, she was giving this gift to Jesus. Now, of course, because people are the way people are, somebody judged her. That was Judas, one of the fellow disciples. He was started to complain. He's like, well, why didn't she sell this very expensive perfume and give that money to the poor? Now, we kind of always saw, like, we were always suspicious of Judas. At least I was, right? Like, I always knew Judas was a bad apple. He didn't have me fooled. He had everybody else fooled, but not me. No, I'm just kidding. He had all of us fooled. But later we found out, we did some checking after Judas died. He was stealing <laughs> from us. He was, he was embezzling the money. He was, keeping, he was keeping hold of the purse, giving to the poor, and was giving off the top. So really, he was just judging Mary. He was saying this about Mary because he wanted this money so that he could take some for himself. 
She said, oh man, why didn't she do this? How could she? And Jesus, again, defends her. He says, what she is doing is right. Because I will not always be with you. He says, the poor will always be with you. I won't always be with you. And Jesus then said, you know, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, you'll hear about this woman doing this thing. And so Mary then washed Jesus' feet. That wasn't the last time Mary played a, a huge part in the story of Jesus and the cross and the resurrection. Now, different, different apostles will have slightly different accounts, but one thing we'll always say, they all say the same thing. The one person that for sure was at the tomb when Jesus rose from the dead was Mary of Bethany. The first person to see Jesus alive after his resurrection was Mary of Bethany. And the first person to share the gospel, the good news that Jesus died and rose from the grave, was Mary of Bethany. So who is this woman, right? Who is this woman that was ashamed and rejected, unwanted, guilty, pushed out, who then became the first evangelist, the first one to share the good news of Jesus rising from the dead? This is the story of Mary of Bethany. All right, so that's, that is Mary of Bethany's story, right? That's, that's the beautiful story of Jesus interacting with this woman and her life being radically, radically transformed by interacting with Jesus, by feeling the love and acceptance of Jesus. So let's think about this. Oops, sorry. Oh, no. Oops. So um, I had some problems with the slides, and my slides were lost. So I apologize. I don't have slides for the next little piece. But let's talk about this. Um, we all have this desire. Right? So one of the deepest desires that we have is to be loved, is to be wanted, is to be known and loved. This is some of the deepest things that drive us. In fact, one of the things that drive us to do the things that we do. Think about it. Why do you work so hard at school? Why do you work so hard doing, whatever, doing things after, after curricular activities? Why do, you not do those, why do you not work so hard to do those things? When we, when we look at the human person, we find that at the very depth of us, we all have a desire to be known, to be wanted, to be loved. Think about the time, the most painful times in your life. Were you rejected by friends? Think about times when you felt slighted, when someone gossiped about you, or when someone um, said they didn't want you to be around, or you felt like you were unwanted. Those are the most painful experiences we can have. And yet Jesus comes, and he looks at you, he looks at me, and he says, you're loved, and you're wanted. And in fact, if we look at the things around us, many times we go to them to make us feel loved and wanted, right? Because like, maybe if I get good grades, I'll be loved. Maybe if I'm cool or if I'm popular, I'll be loved. Maybe if I have um, better hair, a better, better physical appearance, better body, maybe if I do better at this or I say this or I'm like this, maybe I'll be loved and accepted. And so what happens is we start taking some of these things, and some of these things are good things like getting good grades or like being successful or you know, performing well and, or being a, 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 you know, an obedient to your parents. All of these things are good things. But we treat them as like a mirror, right? Where we look into them and we say, okay, I want you to love me. I want you to make me feel loved and accepted. We can even do this to other people. We can look at other people and say, I want you to make me feel loved and accepted and wanted. But what happens when you look into a mirror is, is it just reflects back the fact that you'd want that and you're not getting that. And so when we treat these things in life, relationships, when we treat um, success, when we treat hard work, when we treat obedience, whatever it may be that you're looking to, to find that love and acceptance, when we treat that, we end up finding ourselves even more empty. If we treat that as the ultimate thing, we'll find ourselves more empty. So what's the answer? I was thinking about this past week, and it struck me. I always loved stained glass windows. You know what stained glass windows are? They're the one, windows that are all colored, and then the light shines through. Sometimes they have like a picture on them. I never really understood fully why I love stained glass windows. But I was thinking about this past week, and, and I think I found the reason. It's because stained glass windows, the only way they're actually beautiful and they work is when they let the light shine through. Because you can imagine 
Like think about the difference between a stained glass window and a mirror. <laughs> the mirror just reflects you. It reflects your need. It reflects the emptiness you feel. But stained glass windows, they let the light in. And only if the sun can shine through, a, through the stained glass window does it actually portray the beautifulness of it. And so when you look at a relationship, instead of looking at it as a mirror, saying, I'm going to find all my love, I'm going to find my identity, I'm going to, make, I'm going to feel wanted in this relationship but through my friend. I'm going to look to my friends to make me feel like I'm enough, or I am, again, loved and accepted. If you do that, it's like you're looking into a mirror. But if you treat your friends and say, look, God gave me these friends I know I only can find my true worth and identity in God, but he can show me that through my friends. So just like a stained glass window shows the light through the stained glass window, so like being in a relationship with your friends can show you God's love. So, yeah, doing good in school, that can show you God's love as a stained glass window. So being obedient, so doing all of these things, performing well, at whatever it may be, can be a stained glass window. Money, success, all that. Food, everything can be a stained glass window. And when we stop it and turn it into a mirror, that's where we end up feeling the pain and difficulties and suffering. That's where we feel the emptiness and the loneliness. And just like Mary, who found her true identity, she found her true source of feeling loved and knowing that she's loved and wanted in Jesus, so we can do the same. Right? We can find that source of our joy and happiness and our Full satisfaction in Jesus. One more thing about stained glass windows. The thing is, you can also be a stained glass window. Jesus was the ultimate stained glass window. Right? Because his life, from beginning to, at, to the end, was one big picture of showing God's love through it. Right? Everything he did, every action he did, including dying on the cross, was just an expression of the Father's love. Like the sun shining through the window. It was just an expression of the Father's love to us. And so even we can follow in his example. Think about this. You could be a stained glass window to somebody else, right? Instead of looking at someone and being like Judas, right? Instead of being like Simon, instead of being like Martha, and judging someone or pushing someone out or rejecting them or putting them down, making them feel small, you can instead be like Jesus and shine Jesus' light like a stained glass window lets in the light, can shine Jesus' light and tr treat them and love them, treat them well and love them, Accept them and show them that they're wanted and accepted. Instead of pushing them away because of the way they dress or the way they look or the way they talk or who they are. So we can then, we can be like Jesus in that. We can share Jesus' love in that way. And so, as I look at Mary's story, I see a bunch of windows she was called the sinner for a reason, right? There were a bunch of windows that she was trying to find her happiness in, her um, worth in that were ruining her. And it caused her shame and guilt. She felt rejected and lonely. And then Jesus turned that around. And he took the windows and he made them into stained glass. Or he took the mirrors and made them into stained glass windows where she could fully feel and understand the love of God. And it radically changed her from the sinner, the outcast, to the first evangelist telling the good news that Jesus had risen from the dead. And so that, that is what we'll end today on Mary of Bethany, and we'll talk about communion. And we're going to do communion today. And as we do communion, look at, again, leading up to the death, of, the death of Jesus and the resurrection, we understand that, that Jesus has offered himself for us. That's one of the reasons we take communion, because it represents this fact that he has offered himself to us. That he has said, I am going to lay down my life for you, and I'm going to give myself to you. In the same way that food brings us sustenance, right? it fills a hunger, a desire. When you get hungry, your stomach starts to growl, you get thirsty, your mouth gets parched. You have a desire for food. The same way we have a desire for food, we have a desire for that love, that acceptance to be known and to be loved. To be, to be wanted, not because of something we did, or because of a mask we wear, but because of who we are. And that desire, Jesus offers himself to us to fulfill that desire. Just like food fulfills the desire of hunger, Jesus fulfills that desire to be known and loved. So in communion, we recognize that we're taking on, 
We're, we're taking Jesus, we're receiving His love, we're receiving His grace in our lives.